All right, everybody. I've got top of the hour here. Um, those of you on the West Coast, good afternoon. Um, or I should say East Coast, good afternoon. West Coast, good morning. It's still 11 o'clock here, um, both in Arizona and in the Pacific time zone. Welcome to what I believe is our 50th virtual Thursday training event for emergency reporting. Uh, this week's topic is Google Maps integration, using Google Maps within emergency reporting, and some best practices that we're going to show you today on uh, making the most out of uh, this really cool integration that we have with Google Maps. So welcome to everybody who's joining us today. I know we see a lot of familiar names um, on the uh, roster today, so thank you for sticking with us. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll learn something new today from us. And uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's get started as more people are jumping in. This is great. I'll be one of your presenters today. My name's Tom Lewis. Um, those of you who have been with me for many of our other Virtual Thursday trainings are familiar with me. Retired out of Southern Arizona, been with ER since 2004, and a trainer since the end of 2011. Also with me today is Chris Ekstrom. He's a training captain out at Cripple Creek, 10 years in the fire service, and he's been with ER since 2006 and a trainer with us since earlier this year. So it's good to have Chris on board. He's got some really neat tips to show you today on how he's made the most out of uh, Google Maps, especially for use with uh, ISO ratings. As always, we'd like to mention our uh, different training opportunities besides our online virtual Thursdays. Um, we can have online uh, training opportunities specifically for your department. On-site training where we come, uh, our trainers come to you and we have live training in, in the classroom environment. And we also have our regional training conferences where multiple departments attend to learn about the system. In that regional training conference, we have three days. We have the essentials, which is the basic day that covers the core components of emergency reporting along with the training module and the incidents module. Those are the two of the most commonly used by all levels within a department. Then we have integration, which is day two. That day is driven by you, the students, and that's actually a lot of fun. It's one of the most fun days just because all the questions and answers are driven by the students' needs that day. We also take time to do some networking with everybody in the, in the class and uh, share some best practices from the region that we're currently in because everybody does it a little bit differently across the country. So uh, get some, learn some really neat tips and tricks uh, going to these events. Then, of course, the last day, the third day, is called our leader or lead ER where we focus heavily on the administration module, the reports module, and then we have a mini meta scrum where you help us develop the product and you tell us some of the key features that our system needs to help you do your job easier. You can learn more by contacting uh, Casey at emergencyreporting.com. She can get you all the details, including prices. And you'll also know that back before we had on our login page, we had the ability to view schedule for the upcoming events. But if you simply go to eventbrite.com and type in emergency reporting, you'll see the closest event near you. And that's eventbrite, B-R-I-T-E, dot com, all one word. Our next uh, regional training conferences are going to be uh, in September, a couple weeks from now, in Valley Hill, North Carolina. We've got a lot of people attending that one. Um, I think we're well over 30 people there. All right, the one following that in November will be in Rainbow City, Alabama. And then we have an event at Lockheed Martin in Fort Worth, Texas, the first week of December. So if you're near any of those and would like to, uh, to join us, we'd love to have you. And just, again, contact Casey or check out the Eventbrite site for more details. We'd like to welcome our nine new or upgraded customers that uh, – happened since our last visit um, last uh, last week on August 28th. So if there's anybody, um, any of our new or upgraded customers joining us today, welcome. Glad to have you part of the emergency reporting family. And uh, you picked a good day to, to join in on a virtual Thursday. This is going to be a fun one. You can learn some pretty neat things uh, that the system has to offer. So uh, again, thank you for being part of the emergency reporting family. Where can you find the latest info? As always, the system alerts that come up at the top of the page here, uh, free training uh, as this example here, but also we have system updates. These are generated by our office. Once you view them, you can click the X, but if you ever need to go back to them and see a list of two years worth of the different updates, including training, uh, things that have changed to the system, any other alerts, you can simply click on the support button and it'll take you right right to it and you'll be able to, uh, to see uh, the historical postings 
uh, for system alerts, even if it's not on your welcome page. And our feedback site, feedback.emergencyreporting.com. It's a two-fold site. Half of it is the knowledge base, where we have articles and videos and ways to help you learn the system at your pace and at your, your convenience. And then the other half is where you give us ideas to improve the system. And, you, and then you get your colleagues to vote, neighboring departments to vote. And not, that, not always that the most votes gets developed, but I can tell you that the ones with the most votes gets a lot of attention. And often they do uh, indeed move through the development pi uh, pipeline. Okay, today Chris and I are going to go over um, the Google Maps integration. Um, we're going to talk about how it integrates with occupancies and the OVAP score. For those of you that don't have our vision product, the OVAP score is the Occupancy Vulnerability Assessment Profile. It allows you to assess and then manage the risk within your jurisdiction based on um, individual structures. And we'll, we'll take a peek into that in a little while. Um, also, incidents, how your incidents populate on the map. And then, of course, hydrants with the NFPA 291 color coding based on uh, fire flow. We'll also show you how to, how to place hydrants and occupancies on the map and how to move hydrants and occupancies on the map as well. Because um, sometimes, and what's, we'll get into it actually, but sometimes Google, the address, is usually good for the structure because it puts it in the center of the parcel. But addresses for hydrants aren't so good because it stacks it right on top of the building. And usually hydrants are not inside the building. They're around the building. So we'll show you that. And then how you can export to Google Earth and use some of the features in Google Earth uh, for things like ISO presentations, post-incident analyses, and things like that. Do some best practices. As I mentioned, incident action plans, ISO audits, and post-incident analyses. One thing I do want to mention to all of you, and uh, and I recommend you do this once you have good data in your occupancy module, hydrant module, and incidents, and incidents less so, but definitely hydrants and occupancies, is that you have the ability, if you're an administrator, to go into the administration module, into the upgrade center. It's a button along the top bar, and I'll show you that. And you can try out the Google Maps for 30 days at no cost to see if it's something you're interested in. We'll take a peek at that, and then we'll do some. We'll have plenty of time for questions and answers today, and then we'll uh, wrap things up. And it should take us about an hour to get through everything. So, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Give me just a second to toggle back over to the browser. All right, here we are. I'm going to hide my sidebar. Oops, hi favorites. There we go, so we have a nice full screen. So let me let me go back out and do a couple quick things here. Once we've logged in, and I wanna show it to you now because I, I guarantee it, by the time we get rolling here, I'm gonna forget later on. So under administration, if you're an administrator, if you see on the horizontal button bar here at the top, click on Upgrade Center, and you have the ability to activate a 30-day free, free trial. We just had another customer that is interested in this, but they haven't built their hydrants yet. So if unless you have really good data already with your occupancies and hydrants, I would wait till you have it and then go ahead and activate it. And all you do is click the button, accept the terms of service, put your password in, and you're good to go for 30 days. Any questions at all on that, guys? Pretty straightforward. All right, where I'd like to start first is in the occupancy module. So I'm going to jump over to the occupancy module. And a couple things here. I am going to actually show all my occupancies for this area. And when you're doing the search uh, fields up here, I had, we were goofing around earlier and I searched for our headquarters. And I put in Coho Way and, it, and the, the address in Coho. Again, I have four different structures there. For whatever reason, um, one was a test, but I had four structures there, so that's what it showed me. So if I were to export to Google Earth right now or to switch the map view, it will only show me those four um, selected structures based on the search that I, I entered. But what I want to do is show all of them so you can get a little better picture for everything. Okay, so here I am um, with all of my occupancies, 
And if I scroll down to the bottom, it should tell me at the bottom of this page, I have a total of, on the lower right corner, I have four pages worth of occupancies because there's you can have up to 500 occupancies per page. And I have about 1,800 occupancies in the system right now. Um, and they are spread out geographically. They're not just located in the Bellingham area. So we'll go back up to the top. And we'll take a look at what they look like on the map. And to do that, I don't want to export to Google Earth right yet. All I want to do is switch to map view. And that's going to be in the far right um, of the bar here, just below the button, just below the horizontal button bar. So what I've got here is all, are all of my occupancies. It's in a pinwheel because as I zoomed out to this level, it clusters them because the detail would be, you know, you wouldn't be able to show the detail at this, this zoomed out range. They would all kind of stack on top of each other. But as I zoom in, and the zoom in uh, slider is on the left-hand side of the page, as I zoom in, things start getting a little clearer and I'm able to see the structures and the pinwheels break apart a little bit. And then now I'm able to see my various structures. You'll notice most of our structures are gray, which means there's no score calculated. If there was a score calculated and the higher the score on the OVAP, the, the, uh, the higher the score on the OVAP, the riskier, the greater risk that structure presents to the, uh, to the community. And that, we have another virtual Thursday that talks about OVAP and the, uh, the vision product, but that's how you get your color coding. When those of you that don't have the vision product, you're wondering, how come, the, how come the buildings are green or different colors here? It's because they have an OVAP score associated with them based on data collected about that structure. We take a quick pause. I see we have a question. April's asking what happens after the 30-day trial. Well, we hope you buy it. Uh, <laughs> we hope you choose to purchase it. Um, and they would give you, the, our team at the office or the regional sales rep, April, would give you the, uh, the cost for that. Um, it's not exorbitant, um, but we, we hope you like it enough that you'd want to um, continue with it. Um, and if not, then it just turns off. It just turns off after that 30-day free trial. So good question. Okay. So as you can see, a couple of things that you need to know uh, from working here in the actual map view is I have the ability to toggle on my hydrants. Now, this is confusing because um, I've run into this in a couple of other departments. It's like, well, it says hydrant, so you think that's kind of a title bar. Um, what it actually is, is a toggle button to turn on your hydrants. So you can see where your hydrants are in relation to your structures. And what I had mentioned earlier is that if the hydrants were put in with the same address as the structure, they're going to be right on top of the structure. So this is a good example of how not to do it. Um, we had just put this in because we didn't obviously we obviously didn't have the like the lat, lat longs of the hydrants um, for the system. So um, we were just putting some hydrants in um, to go along with some of the structures. But in, in what we'll do is, and Chris will show you this when we go into hydrants, how you can move hydrants around. As I toggled hydrants on, you'll notice over here on the lower right, not only do I have my OVAP score table, but I also have my uh, NFPA 291 table based on hydrant flow, and they will color code accordingly. If I click on a hydrant, it'll tell me the hydrant number, whether or not it's in service, its address, and then I can print information about the hydrant. I can go in to edit the hydrant. I can do a flow test on the hydrant, or I can generate a work order or see the work orders for that particular hydrant. So these four links here take me into the hydrant module. So if, if I wanted to, I could just click on that and it would allow me to go edit that particular hydrant. It takes me right to it. But since we're focused on occupancies, and notice it kept my previous default, my previous settings, so we'll get back to where we were. Switch back to map view. Zoom on in to where the structures are. Now, more importantly for what we're talking about now regarding occupancies is I can click on an occupancy. Tell, it tells me what that occupancy is. I can print information about it. So say I wanted contacts, pre-fire plans, systems, any chemicals, and any images I have. If I, well, I did check all. I could have just checked one box right there. Click OK. And I'll get another tab that opens up. 
with the occupancy info, as long as my internet cooperates. Patience is always a good thing. And there it is in a two-page printable PDF. Not a bad tool for when you're on scene. You can see it even has some, uh, some chemicals on the premises. And that can be taken directly from the, the, uh, the Google Map integration here. Now, I'm currently in Map View. As I zoom in and I wanted to see some more details, I can switch over to Satellite View. And I'm able to see the top side of my structure, a little better detail of exposures, access. And then if Street View is available, I can go down into Street View as well and be able to see even additional detail. And you can see there's that green occupancy right there. The icon will still appear. It's kind of small, but if you look for it, you'll know it's there. 2500 Meridian Street. And then I can kind of get a little 360 of what's going on around me at the time. Any questions on that? All right, I'm going to go ahead and click back out to the overhead view. And again, the advantage we always talk about too, especially when you get OVAP scores like this, you can see if you've got clusters of structures that pose a greater risk to your community and how you can visually show the leaders of your of your uh, jurisdiction, be it a town council, city council, uh, fire district board, you can show them because they want to see it in a visual. Uh, visuals always seem to be more effective than just text. You can show them, okay, we've got a, a cluster of, you know, oranges and reds in this area, but our closest station is, you know, six minutes away, a lot of chemicals, you know, do we need to do more public education in those areas? Um, so it gives you that graphical, that visual depiction. So any questions on occupancies in the map view? Just remember this turns on hydrants to where you can see the actual hydrants as well. Okay, with no further questions, I'm going to go into the incidents and then we'll pass it on to Chris for hydrants. Oh, I do want to add one other thing too that um, I may not have mentioned previously. I'm going to switch back to grid view. And on the grid view, if I just want to see a certain zone and then switch to map view, it will just show me that zone as in lieu of the entire, all the structures. Switch to grid view. I want to see station three. What I'm looking for is a short list, a relatively shorter list here. And that's pretty decent. So about 70 structures. Switch over to map view. And it should be showing me just the height, just the structures in that in that section. Likewise on an advanced search, if I want to just see the for like inspectors, if I just want to see and this may not have any, so if I could go with, okay, I want to see all the occupancies that are due for annual inspections. I can select that, run my advanced search. It will give me this table. There's none in 5B, so let's go with all. So all of these structures, and again, it's not all of them, it's just 27, then it should, keyword should, show me those 27 structures on the map. So then I can see at a glance the structures that are all due on an annual on an annual basis, and that one reset properly. Don't forget about the advanced search here. It's, it's easily overlooked, but it can really get you some, some very good details, both in the grid format and in the map view as well. 
Another good one is if you've got structures that are missing latitude and longitudes, you can click on that. And that's a great way to update your, your data for structures. You may have addresses, but all of these do not have latitude and longitudes if you wanted, if you're keen on making sure that data is entered so you have accurate, uh, spot on accurate locations of the various structures. All right, let's head out to incidents. So here we've got a list of all our incidents and I want to go ahead and switch over to map view. Now two of the features that I have in the map view, it defaults to heat map and the heat map shows me kind of where the clusters of the, the incidents are taking place. You can see by the green and the yellow, the, uh, the density of the calls. Or I can switch over to the pin map and it will show me the actual specific incidents. As you can see, red triangles of fire, blue star of life is an EMS call. And then as I zoom in more, we have three calls here at the Bellingham Department. And if they're all on the same address, they won't parse them out, unfortunately, to where you can select each one individually. But if they're not stacked on one another like that, you can click on it and go straight to that actual, that actual incident and make edits or get more details about it as well. Again, I have the ability to show hydrants and show occupancies as well. I can also toggle between map and satellite. And again, what's nice is back out at the grid view, I want to do an advanced search. And I just want to see the fire calls. So let me get my, I got my date range, incident type. And let's say we'll do a range. So I want to see all the 100s, Enfers 100 series calls, 100 through, let's just say 173, all the 100 series calls. I'm going to go ahead and change my search. Oops. Go right there. Then do my search. That's the button I wanted. So now what I'm showing are just my 100 series. There's 102 of them. I switch over to map view. And I'm now able to see all of my fire calls from my jurisdiction or whatever type of call you're looking at. Tim's got a question here. Okay, Tim, the section that I'm in for heat maps are I'm in the incidents module. This is happening in the incidents module. So to show you quickly, I go to incidents, it'll give me the grid. And then if I wanted to do it, what I was doing was an advanced search, but the key here is to switch to map view. And then that shows me my heat maps by default, pin maps I can select, occupancies and hydrants and occupancies for some reason isn't showing and the only thing I can think of is based on what I've selected in occupancies it's just limiting what I have uh, what it's populating there which is very likely one thing I would like to mention before we jump over to hydrants because this will be a nice segue into Chris's discussion about the hydrants is our system does a decimal degree format. So if you have from your, say, collection of GPS data, um, say you go out with your iPhone and you collect the data, okay? You can use, and I just I use iPhone as an example, if on your iPhone you turn on the ability to have the compass display your Latin long, you'll notice that it's in decimal or it's in degree, minutes, seconds. So keep, that can be a great tool to go out and capture this data if you don't already have it in a database, um, say from your water company or from your building department, public works, uh, what have you. 
you can capture that. So just make sure that you um, allow on this on your iPhone because some by default it's not turned on. So on your iPhone that you go to your systems. I want to make sure I get the pathway is exactly right. You go to privacy, location services is turned on, and then you have for the compass, the location service also turned on. If you don't, then you won't get the GPS coordinates down here on the compass. And this is in lieu of having to download or pay for another app. Um, and I know the Android has something very similar as well. So again, if you need to go out and capture this data, it can be done, but just make sure that you know that it's going in the degree minutes, seconds format, and you'll need to convert it. But the ability to convert is very easy. Go to this website, transition.fcc.gov, and then it's got this uh, extension on, on the end of it. If you even do just the GPS coordinator search in Google and you see the transition.fcc.gov one, this is it. And you simply enter degrees, minutes and seconds into the three fields for the latitude, three fields for the longitude, convert, and then copy and paste each of these into say, and I'll go straight to a hydrant, right here in the hydrant. You would copy the Latin long and you would be good to go. So. You can do it that way. And just remember, one thing I want to show you is that you'll notice it's a positive number. But that number is going to put me in China. It's supposed to put me in Bellingham, Washington. But any degrees west of the prime meridian are a negative number. So just remember that your long, your longitude is negative, update it, and it takes me right back out to Bellingham, Washington. I'm going to go back out so you can see it's the latitude was right, but positive puts me in China, negative puts me back in the States. So just keep that in mind when you convert. We're west of the prime meridian, so our numbers are going, our latitudes, or I'm sorry, our longitudes are going to be negative. We're north of the equator, so we're going to have positive latitudes. And the other way you can move a hydrant if you don't have the exact coordinates, is zoom on in, toggle over to satellite, and you'll notice, well, that's right on the structure. It's not there. It's over here in the parking lot or in the grass. So I click move. I pick this up. Move it to where it's at, then click OK. And it's going to update my Latin long. Take a peek. Yep, it's in the right spot. I don't forget to click save, and now your hydrant's in the right location. Okay, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Chris so he can talk a little bit about the uh, how he's used the hydrants module for ISO. So, Chris, are you ready? I'm ready. Thank you, Tom. You got it. Switching over to you. You should have it. All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, hello to everyone. Um, Tom showed us some really good stuff as, as far as how to get into this. We'll just jump right into hydrants right now and do it. Um, my stuff's set up, as Tom said, you know, just a little bit differently maybe than his, but we're going to spend some time looking at the map view under hydrants. And once I click on the map view, and you'll notice under hydrants and occupancies, it's all over here on the right side. Um, that's kind of unique to the, these two modules. When you get into the incidents, it's going to be over here. So just one quick thing to notice. Um, and I did want to mention while I'm getting into this, uh, we are going to show you some Google Earth exports. Just remember on a side note on that, that you do have to actually install the Google Earth program. 
Um, that Google Earth program is obviously an outside vendor. That's all comes directly from Google Earth itself. So you'd have to install it on your computer, your device that you're actually going to use that on. So once it's installed, then it will open correctly. And the KMZ file is what it's called will actually operate and work. So just make sure that you guys notice that um, we can go ahead and post that link here in a minute when we get done. Um, so you guys can copy that link if you'd like to. So. All right, so once we're done out of here, a uh, little bit of a small district, I can zoom in. Oh, it's a little too big. And we can start seeing some of my hydrants in my district. So Tom talked about, you know, some of the different views here on, on Google Earth and, um, or Google Maps, I'm sorry, and how to use them. So if I want to switch over and see, I've got my hydrants, most of them are at an intersection. It's kind of loosely based. I'm going to switch over here to satellite view. We're going to get a good view on that. And once I've placed it, as Tom was showing you, we can actually see it. So I can see my flow test records, all the things that he was talking about. So if I click on my flow test record on that, say I'm testing this hydrant and I'm doing it on a device, this shows my records of all my flow tests and what was done. So if I want to actually edit the flow test, add a new flow test, if you're doing this with a hotspot on, um, on a computer, this is... You know, I, I would definitely recommend either using, you know, some sort of uh, Surface Pro or a laptop, maybe in a, in a truck or something, because if you try to use your mobile device or maybe an iPad or some sort of tablet, it doesn't run a full operating system. So it's it's going to give you a few issues, but it tends to work OK. But if you are having issues, just switch to a, a laptop off a hotspot and you'll have a little little better, better luck with it. So just going to go back there to our old view. And anytime I hit back like that, you'll see it's going to take me back into this file. I need to hit switch to map view and go back into it. So that's a real quick thing on how to see it. So now let's say I'm looking at this hydrant and now this one's out in the open there. And I want to look at it. All right. Fairgrounds, all my notes. Okay. If I want to edit the hydrant or anything, that's all under this once you click on it. So I'm going to go ahead and close that out. And I'm going to zoom in on this hydrant on satellite view. And as Tom was showing you here, you can actually go all the way down to the hydrant. The cool thing is, depending on when uh, the Google car actually came by your location, you can actually see the hydrant. The one thing I've noticed with this, if you want to move this hydrant, you know, you're going to have to actually do it from this view up top. Because if I go down to a street view on this and I actually see what the Google car did, I can actually see my hydrant. And this one's relatively close. Some of them will put them in a different place. So if you try to get real accurate here from this street view and actually move the hydrant over to where you actually see it is, when you pop back out of your street view, um, <clears throat> no, sorry. When you pop back out of your street view, it's going to actually move that hydrant into the road. So it really depends on how you choose to use it. Um, for us, the better view is typically directly from that, uh, that street or from that uh, sky view on there. So this is the better view that we choose to use. But again, you know, as we said before, the way I use it may not be the way you want to use it. I just did want to mention that little note on there. So um, here's our view and that's kind of what it looks like there. So <clears throat> Tom's pretty well covered how to move a hydrant. And if I see any questions, we'll definitely answer that if somebody needs us to go over how to move hydrants. Um, if you see these colors, these colors are all going to be assigned automatically per NFPA 291. That's built within the program. So when you do a, a flow test um, on your hydrants, you'll actually get to see um, these colors will populate. So if you haven't put anything in there, they're not going to be colored correctly. Once you get your flow tests in there, it's actually going to color the hydrant according to this NFPA 291 chart right here. Anything with an X through it, that's going to mean it's out of service. Okay. Uh, most of your out of service hydrants are going to be colored red if that's the reason because the flow issue that they're out of service. If they're out of service because they're broken or damaged or something like that, you're going to have it with the current color, the last flow that it was given and that X. So this is a real neat feature as Tom talked about, you know, when you're, when you're going to do ISO. Um, I recently went through an ISO audit and the one thing that they really wanted to see was how close are my hydrants to the occupancies, especially newer hydrants that they may not have been aware of. So I'll show you a quick trick on how to, how to measure out how far away a hydrant is from uh, a structure. Um, 
you know, once we jump into Google Earth. So for now, that's the way this color is going. Now, if I want to jump out here, what I can do is <clears throat> I can come in here. I can click on my hydrants. I can also place a new hydrant right there. And I can also overlay my occupancies if I choose to, just as Tom showed you. All right. So now let's go ahead and talk about maybe some of this Google Earth export. Again, make sure you've already got Google Earth. I'm going to close this one so it doesn't open the wrong one. All right. So if I lose you, please stay on the line, Tom, and I get back with you. But I am open in a Google Earth file. So sometimes go to meeting tends to crash when you open and close files. But here goes hoping. Give me a second while this loads. Google Earth is a large program, so it can take a little while. It's kind of a neat presentation there. And now it's populated all of my files onto Google Earth. So you see now I've got my hydrant numbers that are all listed within there. It did not load my occupancies. Even if I clicked on occupancies, it's not going to load that unless you're in the occupancy module. It'll, it'll overlay that. Um, I haven't been able to get it to download both at the same time, but depending on how rural you are, Google Maps usually has occupancy addresses on there so we can still see it. And I'll show you where we're at. So with this, I can right click and it's going to give me this little, uh, this little ridicule for those of you guys that play Halo, I guess, but this little target down there that you can use. And as I scroll backwards, I can go in, adjust the speed. I can slow down my speed. I can back out sideways, just some of the cool features with that. So say I want to look at, uh, let's climb over here. We've got some hydrants that are pretty far away from some structures. So here's one that's a, a big deal for us. So I'm zooming in here. Now I can come over and I want to see what is the nearest hydrant because right up here, this building split into, this is a grocery store down below on this side. And this is actually a, uh, an Ace Hardware store. They store a lot of lumber, things like that. A lot of the lumber is stored um, in this shed back here, but I want to see what is my nearest hydrant. What's my distance from here to here. So what I can do, um, Hey Tom, can you see my cursor up on the ruler here? Uh, yes. Okay, so this ruler up top here, I hit show ruler, and I'm going to get this box over here on the left. This box is going to actually allow me to choose what I choose to do. So if you guys are using metric, uh, somebody else in you know, other countries or you know, the Canadian folks out there, give a shout out to my wife and um, <laughs> those people, you can set it into metric. Um, we can set it into inches, feet, miles, yards, nautical miles whatever you guys want to do. I'm not even sure what smoots are, but hey, you can put it in smoots if that's what you want to do. Um, now I'm going to get this, this square target here. I'm going to go ahead and click on the hydrant, okay? Or I can click on the structure. So we'll go ahead and say from the front door of the structure, yeah, hydrant. Let's say we park our first do engine right there. I just click on it. It's going to pin it there. Now I'm dragging this little yellow line. So now I want to say, well, this hydrant looks closest. All right, so there's my distance. And now that's my distance. If you look at that bar up at the top left, it says it's 310.29 feet. So that tells me that's 310 feet. Now that's obviously um, linear feet, straight line, but that's what uh, ISO was looking for in my case. And, and that's what ISO auditor wanted to see with some of these things. All right, so I can pop up and say, you know, if they have something that's not listed, hey, you have some new hydrants you just put in since our last audit, um, you want to go for a new, a little bit better rating schedule. Now you can jump in and do this. So come over here, 330.66 feet. Okay, that was a little closer. Also does a great job for some of your pre-fire planning, that type of stuff. You can judge exactly how far away that hydrant is. So just a cool trick on that. Um, if I want to get rid of it, anytime I move this, it's just going to keep chasing me around. I just click on the ruler. It'll get rid of that line. So some of the cool things that we can do with the hydrants on there um, and downloading this and these files. So, um, and that'll work for anything that uploads into this Google Earth. So we can go ahead and pop out again. <clears throat> and we can look at our latitude and longitude. So one thing, it, you know, if you're rural like we are, Google Maps isn't super 
accurate when it comes to roads and what the names of the roads are. So what if I've had to do, and one trick, kind of a best practices note on here, what I've done is when I'm loading hydrants, when I want to place a new hydrant, I'll actually go in and find maybe the lat long. Give me a second, I'll pop back over here. Now I'm back into the ER, uh, onto the emergency reporting site, and I'm on map view on that. Now, if I want to go in and find one of my hydrants, um, for instance, say I want to add a hydrant over here on this corner, I'm just going to find the closest hydrant right there. I'm going to hit on the edit info right here, and I want to look at, there's our inspection name and location right there. I get my latitude and longitude. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy that latitude and longitude. Um, if you're using an operating system like uh, Google Chrome or a browser, I'm sorry, like Google Chrome, it'll actually save some of these as you start typing them so you can get close. Um, and that'll put, at least pin it somewhat close to the area that you want it to be. And then you can go ahead and drag it into that location. Um, as long as you don't have too many trees or too many overhead obstructions that limit your view, of that hydrant, it will actually work in that lame. So, you know, you've got two options. You can copy and paste your latitude and longitude, you know, copy your latitude, copy your longitude, open in two separate browsers up top here, and you can drag them across. That'll get you close. Otherwise, you can just hit add new hydrant and do it directly from the map view. So <clears throat> this is just showing me my current view on that. I can move it. I can do whatever I want with it. Okay. Now, I would definitely recommend, um, you know, using a browser when you're first entering these things like Google Chrome, just because it does save your keystrokes and you'll actually get an autofill option to where as I start typing, um, it'll give me whatever the last, uh, the last information was that I had typed in. So um, it's not giving it to me right now because I haven't typed anything for a while and I, I've cleared my, my cache and my cookies quite often on here. So um, little note on that, on um, hydrants and I think that's about it. Is there any any questions on what we've covered so far on hydrants? Not seeing any, so, well. Chris, just out of curiosity, you know how you were showing the hydrant by the structure using the ruler in Google Earth. How does that compare uh, when in our system where we show the closest hydrant to a structure? So in other words, if you pick a structure um, pick like a hydrant in a structure and there in the ruler, you had like 300 and some feet. Go to that mm -hmm. structure in your in our system and it's supposed to show the 10 closest hydrants. Okay. Can you demonstrate? I wonder how, I'm curious how. Absolutely. How accurate that is. Okay. So I can go into the, well, let's just do this. Let's do it the quick and easy way. I'm going to go to my map view on here. And I'm hoping that we have an occupancy on here. Yep. So I can go into my occupancies here. <clears throat> and I can look at, looks pretty darn accurate. Yep. I mean, 96, 310 feet. Yep. So that's, that's another great. way to do it right there. It's there for you. And like Chris, show, call, like Chris showed, too, it's, it's line of sight. It's not around corners and around streets. It's it's as the crow flies, basically. So, yeah, it's it's direct line of sight. So, you know, you probably always add a little bit in there for turns and bends for the apparatus as it's laying the line. But at least we know it's pretty darn accurate. Absolutely. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions on this, Tom. So unless there's something else you wanted me to show them on hydrants, I think we've pretty much beat that, beat that into the ground. That's great. Excellent. Nice job. All right. I'm going to go ahead and pass this screen back over to Tom and we'll both be with you for the day. And if you have any questions, ask them, you know, we're, that's what we're here for right now. So. Okay. I think the, the, la the one thing I want to show next is just uh, doing post incident analyses. So let me, uh, Show my screen. Make sure you're seeing the right screen. So let me give you an example. Um, I'm going to pull up my Google Earth, and I did a very simple export to Google Earth um, for doing this post-incident analysis. So we had a fire at this residence, and what I did, I did multiple exports. I selected just a cluster of hydrants, and in this case, I made it very simple. I just did two hydrants, the two closest hydrants. I think there's one up here, but um, I was I was mostly just playing with 
with the actual uh, export. So I, I selected, so let me toggle back over. I just selected my hydrants uh, based on the address. And remember, notice here too, whenever you guys are doing searches, if you have two search fields and you're like, oh, I want to change it to street, but you were looking for an ID, currently you've got to clear out those other fields and then do a research or redo the search, and then it will give you what you want. Soon, just by typing and removing it, the search will automatically be conducted. So just keep that in mind. Our, our pending maintenance grid does that already, and soon our other grids will do it as well. So here I've got my two hydrants. So those were the two hydrants I exported. I did a Google, Ex Google Earth export. So what that did was give me this KML file, or in this case, a KMZ file of these two hydrants. All right, and I downloaded it, and I'm on a Mac, but basically I downloaded it, and all I need to do when I download that KMZ is double click on that file, and it will automatically go into my, it will automatically go into Google Earth as that extension, the KMZ or KML. So those were the two hydrants, and then I, just for, uh, in, from incidents then, I also did a search for, and I knew the number, so it was 14084. I did a search for just that single incident, and I exported that also as a KMZ, which then appears. I downloaded it, double click it, it populates that incident right on the address. And you'll notice uh, the way I understand Google, how it geocodes is it, it's, it gets the parcel data and, it, and if there's an address associated with it, it typically parks it on the center of the parcel. At least that's been my experience. If anyone knows otherwise, just you know, type in and let me know. But I believe that to be the case. Uh, and then I also did occupancies, but that is for all the Bellingham, Washington area occupancies. And that's if I go up on the map there, but it shows me my KMZ data of all the various exports uh, that I brought in from my occupancies. But really all I was concerned about was this incident. So we've got our two hydrants and I'm gonna prepare a post-incident analysis for this. So I take all of this and yes, I can add pin markers such as a, a place mark here as to show my apparatus if I'm inclined to do that. And click OK. And I can do it that way. But also I can do, like Chris showed before, was I wanted to see how long my lays were. So I can confirm that. OK, I think we had about 200 feet on the ground. So I can convert, I can do that. And so our apparatus went to there. And I'm seeing about a, if I hit stop, I've got 191 feet on the ground, roughly, of, of hydrant light. So what, what does this do for me for a post-incident analysis? Well, I can take a picture. I can save the image right here on the, the toolbar here for Google Earth. I save that image. It'll prompt me to save it to a location and title it. And I'd save it to, say, my desktop. And then what I can do is I can work with that image and I just worked with it in PowerPoint as, as one option. There's a lot, you know, Paint, you know, uh, a lot of the Adobe programs. You can you can work in it, Photoshop even. So I just simp I wanted to keep it simple, and so I did it in PowerPoint because the images. It's easy to edit the images, so I bring in that that I import that image, and using the the tools given to me here in PowerPoint, you'll see it's got my incident location up here, my hydrants, the yellows are the large diameter lays, the red are the hand lines going into the structure, primary, orange is secondary, where the seat of the fire was, and then all of my apparatus color coded by type with the street names on it. And so I take this image and it creates a great view when you're doing sitting down around the table, projected onto a television, or to a uh, white screen, and everybody gets around the table and talks about it, and then you have the ability to put together a great post-incident uh, analysis document of which this image, where everybody was at and what they did, is part of.
So I think we're all kind of hey, visual. Tom, we got a couple of questions on. Okay. I'm sorry. Keep going. No, no. I, I had my question screen um, off while I was doing this. Was off to the uh, underneath it actually. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Tim, for uh, missing your question here. Um, it's kind of jarbling on the you got put in the middle for some reason. He asked, can you print maps from Google Earth showing the data from emergency reporting? I did answer it writing, um, but if you want to show them how to do it, because I know you have that PDF converter um, and the JPEG. Okay, so the question, can you print maps from Google Earth showing the data from, from ER? Yes, and back here, so let's say... I saved this image. So what I did was I saved this image with, and this is data from, you know, again, it's just the two hydrants and the incident, but I'm going to save this image to my desktop. And it will save as a JPEG. Okay, virtual Thursday. Saved it there, and then I go out to my desktop. Just a second. And then it, it in, on my Mac, it opens in preview. So right now it's opened in preview. So it's kind of a, you're seeing two images here, but the one on top right here says virtual Thursday. I can then in preview, I can duplicate it or export it as a PDF. And then it'll just dump onto my desktop as a, as a PDF, and then I can work with it into the PDF editor. Does that answer your question, Tim? Just go ahead and type a little note if that covered what you want. Excellent. Bye, Jack. Okay. Good seeing you. Okay, and... We've got Richard. Can you can't you sneak up with me when I'm doing this because I almost kissed her. I was like, oh. Uh, can you use Google Maps to get street names into the master street list? That, it. Richard, is a good question, and I'm not sure about that. I don't know if you can export street names out of Google Earth to be able to use for your – so in other words, how I've got all these street names listed here – Hopefully, I'm following what you're saying. Um, oh, looks like somebody says, unfortunately, the way the programming, it is not an option. I just thought that by having roads. Hey, Tom, it, if they could put it into a uh, an Excel spreadsheet under that way, I mean, I'm not sure if there's a way to download anything onto that Excel spreadsheet. They could load it. I mean, it's not going to be a direct link. I think what he's asking is, yeah, is to be able to, can you use, let me see if Richard has a mic and maybe he can, uh, Richard, I'm going to unmute you. If you don't have a mic, just type in, you don't have a mic. But if you do, um, let's see if we're, we're on the right track with you. Hey, Richard, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so are we on the right track with what you're asking? You're hoping to, like, take these street names that are listed here and be able to extract them out of Google Earth and use them as a, the import for your master street list. Is that right? Yes, I'd like to do it in a bulk operation instead of having to type every street name that we've got listed because it's about four pages of fine print. Yeah, and in all honesty, I don't know if you can. If look, looking at this, if there's any way to like Google Earth has these lists of street names, it's part of the Google Earth program. But I don't know if there's any way it lets you extract that out of this view with the street names only. I'd have to explore Google Earth or maybe do some searching on Google Earth to see if that's possible. Um, somebody had typed in. I don't know if that was Mark. Is uh, Mark Vodapich one of our Support text is on with us. He may have typed in uh, the answer that, unfortunately, the way the programming um, is, it's not an option. So um, now that's in, in in our Google Map integration. You can't pull the street names now in Google Earth. I don't know if you, that's he's probably referring to the the Google Map integration here. Let me go back to it. The Google, okay, Map well, was, uh, the, the Google Map integration here within our system where you have all these street names, those aren't in, those aren't exportable or importable from here. As to whether or not it can be done in Google Earth, I would have to do a little research on that. 
I was trying to maybe scan the sheet, but it, uh, I, I can't, if I could save it in the CSV file, I might get it, but I can only save it in JPEG right now. Right, right. Yeah, there's somewhere to take this table of street names out of the Google Earth. I, like I said, I would just have to explore it. And if anybody else listening in knows how to do it, definitely t- type in or you know chime in and let us know. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for the question, question Richard. And then we also um, have from Brian, he's asking, we have all of our hydrants in a Google Earth KML file already. Can you import it? Well, let me show you, Brian, quickly here on the importability of hydrants on what you as, a, as an end user can do. You may need to tweak that file a little bit to get the, uh, the data, but if you have the Latin long especially, which I think is the most valuable when you're bringing in hydrants um, into our system, is you have the ability to go to hydrants. And if you have administrative privileges for hydrants, you click on settings. You go to imports. Go to hydrants. And then it gives you an example of the data required to be able to import your hydrant data. So depending on what is in that KML file for all of your hydrants, which I'm imagining it's going to have the Latin long most likely in the in that, then you have the ability to upload a CSV of that file. And let me show you what that looks like the raw version of it with um, just a moment to find it and I'll show you what that will look like. Give me just one second for the Excel to open for me. So anything that's in that KML table that will fit in any of these fields here on hydrants, you can then import into the system. And hopefully, some of that's going to be here, the lat long. And that will give you, if you have good data, you're gonna have spot on locations for your um, uh, for your hydrants in, in, in the emergency reporting system. So I hope that answers your question there. Make sure we don't have any other input from our team on that one. Nope, that should be the best way to do it. Yeah, and I guess the only other suggestion would be see if you can do what you did with that converter, Tom. If he can open a KML file or save a KML file and then open it in in Excel or something and put that make that information a little better. I don't know oh, how easily in, KML goes in. Yeah, if it's degrees, if it's degrees, minutes, seconds you'll want to convert it, but by using this, and I did post that link to the chat there, uh, the link to this site um, to be able to convert it for you. So yeah, that's this is, our system's gonna want it like this in decimal degree. All right, I think, I think we covered everything. Let me make sure we did before we uh, close out for today. We talked about ISO, incident action plans, post-incident analysis. We got that. Talked about the uh, 30-day trial. You guys remember if you have administrative privileges, if you don't have Google Maps right now, you know, go ahead and play with it. Occupancies, incidents, and hydrants, and moving and placing. Did we show how to place one, Chris? Do we show how to place an, a hydrant, um, a fresh one? Uh, I don't think we did. Let's, let's do that. All right, let's do it real fast. All right, I'm going to go into, so say you're out and about and you have a, a hydrant, we're in map view. I always like to make sure we cover everything. So I'm going to switch the map view and we're out and about and we've got a brand new subdivision down here on B Street and Halleck. I'm going to place a new hydrant. I click and I can put it where I think it's supposed to be right there give it the next ID or a different ID. I click save. And now I've got a new hydrant there placed visually from the map. And then now I can go in and make edits to it. Print it, edit, do flow test, or see work orders. So I wanted to show you that. So you'll see when you're in hydrants or in occupancies down at the bottom, there'll be a button that says place new hydrant. And when you click on it, it doesn't seem like it does anything. But then when you go and move your your pointer as a hand, 
it'll place it for you. Okay. And for the occupancies, the process should be the same. And let's see, I don't think you can actually let me clear search parameters real quick, make sure. You may not be able to place an occupancy like you place a hydrant. I'm glad I double checked that. Yes, it doesn't let you place a hydrant, place an occupancy like you. You have to go in and add it manually here because of the additional data that's required for it. But you can, like we did in hydrants, place it from the map itself. All right. Hey, a great session today, everybody. Um, thank you for your questions. Hope we were able to answer them as completely as you would like. Chris, anything else you'd like to uh, add before we wrap up for today? No, I think we covered it. No more questions that I'm seeing. Okay. We'll stick around for a minute or so. And let's see. Oh, we just had one come in. That was from Mark. Mark, thanks for joining us. Um, thanks to Casey for being here, um, having our team online to Make sure we uh, stay on the straight and narrow and keep it a good virtual Thursday for everybody and to um, share their tips and tricks. So thanks again to Mark and Casey. Chris, great job. And to everyone who uh, spent part of their day with us, thank you. Stay safe out there and uh, we'll see you on our next virtual Thursday.